Just about everything you need to know about how human beings struggle with temptation can be found in a science experiment called the Marshmallow Test. It's a groundbreaking piece of research. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. First conducted in the 60s and repeated over the decades. So then you'll have to. I'm going to go do something and then I'll come back. This recent example recorded on video shows how it works. Stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? All right. A marshmallow is placed in front of a child. A researcher tells him that if he waits to eat it, he'll get a second one. Then the researcher leaves. Stay in the chair, okay? In these faces, we see ourselves. The universal agony of temptation. And sometimes, the triumph of will over want. So why is that? Why is willpower so elusive for some of us? And why do we struggle so much to keep our bad habits under control? A bad habit that I could get rid of would definitely be my drinking. I'm Irish, so it just kind of runs in my blood. I'm a big procrastinator. I've been biting my nails since I was a little girl. I'm 35 years old, and I'm still biting them. <laughs> I'm smoking, and I've like quit three times, but that never stopped. Sugar, candy, gummy bears. That's my biggest habit, gummies. Charles Duhigg is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter with the New York Times and the author of The Power of Habit why we do what we do in life and business. When you think about all the bad habits that you have, whether it be smoking or gambling or eating sweets or whatever it is, biting your nails, when you do that behavior, the reward is almost instantaneous. Many of us spend too much time texting and watching TV. We're spending a lot to make ourselves feel better. Then there's this big one, smoking. They'll never admit it unless they get caught. But a lot of men watch porn. Or how about a weakness for donuts? And another big one, too much fast food. And then there's the habit we can share with our friends, gossip. The list goes on and on. Charles Duhigg says we're now living in the golden age of research into willpower and habits. Scientists have been studying what's happening in our brains when we form habits and attempt to change the bad ones. Every habit has three parts. There's a cue, which is like a trigger for an automatic behavior to start. And then a routine, which is the behavior itself. And then finally, a reward. And when people think about changing habits for years and throughout history, they've focused on the behavior, on the routine. But what we've learned is it's really the cue and the reward that shapes how the habit functions. And the key is that our brain needs a cue at the beginning to tell it, this is when the pattern should start. And it needs some reward at the end to tell it, these are the patterns you should remember. In fact, we can't live without our habits, because the good ones work for us. When we get in the car and head to work, for instance, it's a complicated task made easy for our brains once it becomes a routine. Your prefrontal cortex, where you make decisions, is not working quite as hard. Activity has shifted to the basal ganglia, the interior of the brain, where our habits and our automatic responses reside. You don't even think about it, but your brain has reallocated energy from this complicated process of backing the car out the street to other things. And from an evolutionary perspective, this is great. You don't have to think about how you're gonna get to work. Instead, you have free brain space to dream up uh, a new invention or think about the meeting later that day. Almost half of the choices we make every day are driven by our habits things start to go wrong when our bad habits take charge. Those that are unhealthy or annoying. 
Well, when men don't put the toilet seat down. Um, I chew gum and sometimes I will swallow it since I was like six. People who are consistently late to things. Naturally, a lot of people choose January 1st as a great time to get started on improving our bad behavior. It starts with a New Year's resolution. People see it as an opportunity to be reborn, and it's deeply entrenched within our psyche. Something inescapable in our souls, practically, or our genetics that continue to drive us to want to grow. At the University of Scranton, Pennsylvania, psychologists have been studying habits and personal change for 30 years, including New Year's resolutions. They found the most common revolve around health issues, money, work, and relationships. And they've been tracking our success rate. When asked in December, 60% of adults will declare an intention to take a resolution. But when we ask them come January 1st, only 40% have actually done so. After one week, three quarters were still sticking to their resolutions. After one month, that number drops to 60%. And after six months, just 40% were still keeping their promises. Have you ever made a New Year's resolution? Yes. What was it? To change my dietary habits. Not drink that much coffee or eat that much chocolate. How did that work out? Not very well. I failed miserably. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, sir? Have you ever made a New Year's resolution? No. How come? I don't, I don't believe in New Year's Revolution. Why is that? Why? Because I never keep <laughs> John Norcross says you're still better off making those New Year's resolutions. You are 10 times more likely to succeed in your goals and resolutions if you try something compared to just wishing for manna to fall from the skies. But since our success rate isn't great, how do we keep those resolutions alive? We challenged three people to break their bad habits. We followed them for six weeks so that we could find out what works and what doesn't. I, I love it. Like, I love smoking. If smoking was a healthy habit, I would do it nonstop. Mark McGracken is a self-employed corporate headhunter. His favorite place to cut a deal, and smoke, is out on the balcony. There's nothing like working hard for an hour and then having a reason to take a break. It's so ingrained uh, into my routine, and that's the hardest part of it. Mark smokes about a pack a day. He's quit before. This time, he says he'd like to stop for good. Said, my main motivation is my daughter. I don't want to put myself in a position of risk where I could be deteriorating my health and uh, not necessarily be there when she's older, you know, see my grandkids and uh, miss out on those stages of my life. So the way that I look at this is uh, it's now or never. Like Mark McGracken, Tom Rubin is looking to someone who depends on him for the motivation to change his ways. He hopes to shed 10 pounds over the next six weeks, but that's just the beginning. He has to lose a lot more. Oh, probably 125 pounds. I'd be happy if I was 200 again. You know, like I am technically now morbidly obese, and anytime the adjective for your condition is death, it's not. It's, it's, it's not sunflowers and rainbows anymore, you know? It's, 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 it's a shitty thing. Halei Kosravi lives to spend. Yes. Oh, this is awesome. A Toronto fashion blogger and a self-confessed shopaholic. Oh, I want to try this one on. Her Yo, favorite better. haunts include this vintage clothing I store. I want rings. Yeah, I want rings where she and a friend, Christiane, like leave a, no stone I'm unturned. Like, it. It's too big for me. Okay, I'm getting it. So, all the way to 200. Mm -hmm. Debit, please. Okay. Thank you. 
We asked Hale how much she spends every month on non-essential items. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. On average, probably like 3500 A month? Yeah. It's been rough lately. Summertime, right? You buy a lot of new clothes. And then you don't wear them. And then you get rid of them. <laughs> Up till now, her mom has helped her pay her bills. But Hale says the time has come for change. She's moving from Toronto to Vancouver for university. I mean, I kind of have change being thrust upon me right now. I will be on my own and will be facing the repercussions. So I can't really take these habits into my actual adulthood. And I really don't wish to. Unlike smoking and overeating, Halle's out-of-control shopping isn't always seen as a bad habit. But psychologist April Benson says it affects up to 9% of the population and an equal number of men and women. It's almost more than alcoholism and eating disorders combined. But as, as I said, it's so condoned by society. She points out that after the terror attacks of 9-11, then-President George Bush encouraged Americans to keep on spending. We cannot let the terrorists achieve the objective of frightening our nation to the point where we don't, where we don't conduct business, where people don't shop. The damage caused by compulsive shopping is very real. A lot of people have so much fear about living their lives because of this secretive, furtive activity. They're afraid other people will find out. So they hide their stuff, they hide the bills. Meanwhile, over at the stop smoking part of the challenge, Mark's girlfriend Claire has decided to try to quit too. Oh, I'm ecstatic. Doing this without her and uh, having her smoking while I'm trying to quit would just make it monumentally more difficult for me. But they're both wondering what this is going to do to their relationship. If you want the realistic answer, I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> for both of us. <laughs> more for him, actually. <laughs> On top of running his business, Mark McGracken also buys and renovates houses. It's a busy life. He says it's in stressful situations like this that the urge to smoke becomes overwhelming. But he also has one big incentive to quit. Between Claire and I, we buy a pack a day and I worked it out. Uh, it's over $7,000 a year. So it's not a cheap habit. For Tom Rubin, it's not just the health consequences. Carrying around all that weight is hard on his self-esteem. I actually read an article about a bunch of school kids, and 60% of them said they would rather be an amputee than fat. That's, that's, that's horrible. <laughs> Somebody would rather lose an arm than be in the condition that I'm in currently. So that, that tells me a lot about how I'm perceived. And I, I don't want to be perceived that way. To bring home his point, Tom suggests that we film this scene. He says this is how many of us see him and other fat people. Grotesque. Someone, something, to laugh about. Around food, weak and out of control. That makes him angry and determined to change. Hale Kosravi has a thing about shoes. She owns hundreds of pairs. These are her favorites. Treasures kept in a case and never worn. What would you say the total value of everything in that case is? Maybe like 10,000? About $10,000? Maybe a bit more? These are Charlotte Olympia. Ah, oh, God, I just fell in love with them. And how much for those? These, I believe, were 1450 
Um, they were bought as a birthday present, but somehow I also snagged these at the exact same time, which were $8.50. And that's not all. She spends a lot of time shopping online. No, I've never used this color. On top of that, she has a bad habit of running up credit card debt. I've never used this color. Buying cosmetics at her local pharmacy. You know, I'm not Carrie Bradshaw. I don't need to have those kinds of items. Yet, for some reason, I keep telling myself, without them, I'll almost be lesser, or I won't have kept up, or people won't think that I know what's what when I do. So, I buy it. So as soon as you open it, it turns on, and then there's a little button on the side here that opens the lens. Ooh, okay, there it's on there. We've supplied our three habit challenge candidates with home video cameras to keep a record of their triumphs and setbacks. The day before the habit challenge begins, <laughs> they meet for the first time and find common ground. At work, I eat my lunch in a stockroom instead of in a lunchroom because I don't want people watching me eat. Yeah. And it's just because there's always this, this negative reinforcement for me mentally that, oh, look at the fat guy shoving his, you know, shoving the sandwich in his mouth. I'm not in my head like crazy over here because like I totally do all that stuff in secret. But no one is under any illusion about replace what's it with ahead. That reward. What I honestly struggle with, what do I replace it with? What is going to give me that sort of satisfaction that I get out of smoking? You should replace the smokes with cookies. Ooh, it worked. It worked and awesome you for the me. Cookies with smokes? Yeah, it, it worked sucked. so. Yeah. When I quit smoking, I was 140 pounds. Oh wow! So oh, yeah. Look forward to it. Thanks, man. I, I, I really don't have willpower. It's gonna be really hard for me not to just kind of black out for a few minutes, make the purchase, come back into myself, and say, "Oh, whoops! I bought that. Oh, darn! That was just a slip. That's not a real relapse. Just a tiny lapse." Like. Get back to that tomorrow. Halle often feels like she's at war with herself over her shopping habit. According to Kelly McGonigal, a researcher at Stanford University and an expert on willpower, that's human nature. There's a part of you who's always going to be interested in immediate survival, immediate gratification, and avoiding any pain or discomfort in the present moment. And that part of you is gonna make very different choices than the part of you who really thinks about long-term goals, uh, your core values, and takes a kind of bigger picture view on your life. And both of those are survival instincts for us as humans. And it's totally normal and human to find ourselves pulled between those two versions of ourselves. That's because one part of our brain pushes us toward our immediate wants and needs. Another part provides us with self-control and the ability to commit to long-term goals like having a healthier diet. And neuroscientists have even found that if you put dieters in the brain scanner and tempt them, you can watch dieters either shift into the, the system of the brain of self-control or not, and then predict whether they'll choose the temptation or the healthier food. And again, we, we go back and forth between these systems uh, so quickly that it can actually feel like a tug of war in moment-to-moment in -moment everyday life. In the tug of war over habits, one thing is certain, there's no shortage of advice out there. But does it work? We estimate that more than 95% of self-help books do not have any scientific research showing their effectiveness as self-help. What's more, some bestsellers actually contain advice that's contradicted by the research. So it's caveat emptor, uh, buyer beware. There's a lot of nonsense out there. So what does work? Sometimes, changing our behavior seems like too much to ask of ourselves in the face of all the other demands in our busy lives. I know that the people who are watching this feel powerless over their habits. It doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter how ingrained this behavior is, any habit can be changed. There are people who are 65 years old who have been smokers for 40 years who give up smoking. There are people who have been overweight their entire life who get into good shape. 
It may not be easy, and it may not be quick, and it probably honestly won't occur the first time, but self-change does occur. That's what I would tell everyone. In fact, 90% of ex-smokers and problem drinkers have changed entirely on their own. This is within our capacity. It's been just a few hours, but so far for Halle, things are going well. I haven't bought anything. I do not intend on buying anything. She's drawing strength from the meeting with the others. <laughs> you know, misery loves company, and I guess that's kind of what I found there. I found some other people where I, I thought to myself, well, I'm going to struggle, and so are they. So at least it's not just me. <laughs> Lots of research shows that social support and helping relationships make a difference. Whether it's a gym buddy or someone you're going to lose weight with. When we feel close and connected to others, uh, it literally shifts us physiologically into a state of willpower. It shifts the brain into that self-control system. And we also know that willpower is contagious. We catch up with Tom fixing a salad in his hotel room before he flies home to Halifax. It looks like he's off to a good start, too. But then, he makes a confession. He did anything he shouldn't have? Uh, yeah, yeah, I totally did. Already. I, uh, I went downstairs and had uh, the breakfast buffet, because I had a free voucher. So, free food. Can't give it up. It was definitely not the, the smartest decision, I guess but he's determined to get back on track, no matter how much it hurts. <laughs> that's, that's kind of like licking a battery. Oh. That is, that's bitter. Tom will need to steer clear of the breakfast buffet and other temptations. I'm gonna miss a lot of things though. Some chicken wings. By far, the most frequent question I'm asked is, how do I sustain the behavior change once I get started? We start by avoiding high-risk triggers, people, places, and things that are likely to prompt the problem. If you want to change a habit, what you can't do is just extinguish it. Into a vacuum, a craving will emerge. If you try and just willpower through it and say, I'm never going to do X again, that eventually you're probably going to fail. But if you replace that habit, if you find a new behavior that corresponds to the old cue and delivers something similar to the old reward, then it's much, much easier and much more likely, according to studies, for that new behavior to take root. All right. <laughs> oh, that's the stuff. <laughs> Not really at all. We tried these uh, vapor cigarettes and uh, I mean for me actually to be honest it's nothing like a cigarette, it tastes nothing like a cigarette but it's not bad, it's better than having a cigarette. What were your thoughts? It's not the same at all. It's, it, first of all it's a cigarette on steroids and doesn't feel right and actually it just makes you want to go out and buy a pack of smokes to prove it wrong. <laughs> The reality is, quitting smoking is rarely easy. Our mood swings have been <laughs> terrifying. We definitely go from zero to yeah. extremely angry very quickly yeah. right now, which uh, is a challenge, but, uh, but we're getting through it. We're going to have another night of long silences when we try and have a conversation because we can't talk without getting into an argument. <laughs> yeah, we got into quite a few arguments last night, so we haven't smoked the least. There we go. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> peace out. So are Mark and Claire in the grip of an addiction? Or is smoking simply a bad habit? Addiction and habit are on a spectrum, a continuum, and it's unclear where one ends and the other begins. There's some things that clearly are addiction, right? Like opiate, or if you're taking heroin, that's physically addictive. About 100 hours after your last cigarette, once the nicotine is out of your blood system, according to studies, you're no longer addicted to nicotine, physically addicted.